For those who seek adventure, this is the Buffalo Roamer Podcast, sharing the people, places, and moments that make a life on the loose worth living. The thing that's going to stick out to you most is when they open up that plane door. The cold is something like you've never felt. There's a huge blonde grizzly bear. And when it saw us, this thing put its head down, stomped on the ground, and hissed like an alligator. The jungle is so thick. Even if you had a machete, you couldn't get through it. I just crossed this real stretch of desert, and I was really suffering. I'm your host, Will Collins, an adventurer, outdoorsman, and roamer of wild places. I've backpacked the Brooks Range, rafted the Grand Canyon, and canoed from source to sea both the entire Mississippi and Yukon Rivers. I live for adventure, travel, fresh air, and diving into the unknown. And now, I hope to share my passion with you on the Buffalo Roamer Podcast. All right, rocking and rolling, episode 72. Thanks for tuning in yet again. If you're enjoying the show, make sure you're subscribed. That way you get the latest episodes downloaded automatically. Mark Johnson on the podcast today. I'm looking forward to this one. And it's brought to you by Fischel Paddles, fine handcrafted wooden canoe paddles. Try one today and feel the difference. Use the code WILL at checkout for a free paddle hanger with purchase of your new paddle. Fischel Paddles, F-I-S-H-E-L-L, paddles.com. Also brought to you by SREgear.com, family owned and operated outdoor gear shop in Black River Falls, Wisconsin. Great gear, great prices, unbeatable customer service. Use code WILL at checkout for 10% off your first order. That's SREgear.com for all your outdoor gear needs. All right. Episode 72, Mark Johnson. Mark is a good friend of mine. He's a mentor. He's a heck of an outdoorsman. He's the voice of the Colorado Buffaloes for the uh, athletic teams there. Uh, He calls all their games on the radio. Uh, He's one of the best radio broadcasters in the country, and he's an even better guy. I first got to know Mark uh, as an intern at the radio station that uh, he was leading the sports department of, which was 850 KOA in Denver as I was uh, in college and just post-college, one of my first uh, jobs after college. Uh, got to know him through that and have kept in touch and a uh, really good guy and enjoyed talking with him and talking the outdoors with him. So episode 72 with Mark Johnson on Buffalo Roamer Outdoors. Excited to have uh, Mark Johnson along for the ride here today. Uh, one of my early radio mentors and uh, and guys uh, that I've always enjoyed chatting with and, and, and looking up to. So Mark, how you doing, man? It's glad to, glad, good to have I'm you. I'm doing well. Will, it's uh, it's great to see uh, what you're doing. If if you were in front of me, I'd tossle your hair right now. You you've grown <laughs> up on me over the years, and uh, doing some great things. So I, I'm I'm great. Things are good here in Colorado. You know, it's prime time with the Colorado Buffaloes. I'm early to with, and so a lot of excitement around my world right now. Absolutely, that's good. And uh, of course, it's hard for me not to talk Colorado Buffaloes with you because, uh, of course, that's a passion of mine and and uh, and uh, of yours as well, and a job for you. But uh, today, my friend, I'm interested in picking your brain a little bit about the great outdoors. Uh, uh, it's one of my passions and, sure. uh, 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 as you, one of yours too, I know, uh, I remember Mark early on, uh, when I was working at 850 KOA, the radio station, I, I walked into your office, uh, and you were, you were the boss and I walked in and I saw a, uh, you know, a trout sipping a, uh, a mayfly or whatever dry fly it would have been, uh, hanging in the, hanging in your office and just thinking to myself, you know, a young college kid, like, all right, this guy gets it. <laughs> <laughs> you, got, you know, it, it's. I, I grew up in North Dakota. I live out here in Colorado now for 19 years, but I was a North Dakota kid. And and my, my dad was not what you'd call sporting standpoint an outdoorsman. My mm-hmm. uncles all were, and and so they were big influences. Of, you know, and so from hunting and fishing, and you know, I'm involved in the horse world and team roping. And so yeah, th- this time of year. When things get quiet for me, because primarily now I do uh, college football and basketball, uh, th- this time of year gets pretty quiet for me about four months. And so you well know this, having lived here in Colorado, there's no better summer than a Colorado summer. And so I make sure I enjoy it from start to finish before I get busy with football come August. And, uh, yeah, you enjoy the out- great outdoors a lot. In fact, uh, this will play into your show. I My, my bird dog just had a litter of puppies no. two months ago. Oh man! And we had five, and I just found new homes for three of them. Uh, the fourth one's going to a friend of mine uh, up in the Midwest, up in Minnesota. I'm going to drop that here in a couple of weeks. But I'm I'm training a couple of bird dogs right now, getting ready for that fall upland season. Oh geez, that sounds like a handful. How's that been going? It, you know, I'd be anybody who's ever had uh, a litter of puppies. You know, the first four or five weeks are pretty easy, right? 
puppies come. Mama takes care of everything. I mean, she's nursing, she's attending to, she's cleaning up after them. I mean, one thing after another. And so it's the next three to four weeks to get a little bit crazy because all of a sudden now they're becoming puppies. They're not just infant dogs. And uh, you're cleaning up and they're pooping nonstop. And then they start out of the little kennel that I had them in. And so uh, the, the, the last three, four weeks here got a little hairy, kind of uh, mixed emotions. Uh, three of them went to new homes and it calmed things down a little bit. Uh, so I miss them, but it's not a lot quieter around my place right now. So, <laughs> so I'm potty training two of them right now. And uh, I've got uh, elk and, and quail feathers and, and wings I'm working with a little bit. And we're, we're you know, when they're this young, you just have been getting them to enjoy it. And so I'm playing around with little retrieving toys and trying just to get them to understand, oh, we're going to have some fun with this. and It's a game. And so we're having some fun right now. But it's, it's been an adventure the last couple of months. Oh, that's great. And, uh, of course, it's always, uh, always easy to find a home for them uh, before they're born or right when they're born and a little harder when, uh, when they show up to take them away, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. There's no no doubt about that. There were a couple of times, and, and my dog, I, and she, she's a high level bird dog. She's an English setter, by the way. She's she's three three years old, and she is so good. Um, my initial plan was not to breed her, but I kept thinking, man, she has got such an incredible instinct for birds. She's an English setter, and I thought I've got to continue this bloodline. And so I found I found a stud actually out here in Colorado. Uh, a friend of a friend of a guy that I hunt with quite a bit. And uh, as I was talking to him this past fall, he said, you know, I got a buddy of mine that's been breeding dogs for a long time. Not professionally. He's just been doing it for his own, his own kettle of dogs. And he said, he's got a stunt that is a big time dog. And so I made the phone calls and figured it out. And so, uh, you know, made that connection. So <laughs> she's got phenomenal bloodlines. And, uh, you know, it, it's kind of funny because, there have been a few folks that really wanted one of the dogs when they got here. They're gorgeous looking dogs, but they weren't hunters and they just wanted a family dog. And there's nothing wrong with that. But, you know, fellow hunters out there that wanted to utilize these dogs for what they were bred for, because uh, I, th I think this litter is going to be pretty special. They, like I said, it wasn't a big litter. It was only five homes for, uh, you know, four hunting homes that they're going to now. And, and in fact, I made some friends in the process, and so I'm going to hunt over some of those some of those dogs that I uh, helped raise there this fall, and, and get a look at them. And and then my best friend's getting one, and so he'll my dog will hunt with his dog, their sisters, and so a neat deal. And can't believe how attached and how concerned I was about where they were going. Yeah. It wasn't that you know they, they were going to go to good homes, so they went to families. But I wanted those dogs to hunt because they are special, special dogs. That's neat. Yeah, you want the bloodline running in the field because, uh, yeah, right. let, let the dog do what it was born to do, right? Hey, man, no doubt about it. That's yeah. neat. And, and that's cool, too, how it ties a whole nother uh, layer into the into the hunt. It ties a whole nother, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, yeah. peeling layers behind the onion of, yeah, hunting with your dog's brother or sister or, or, or you know, uh, the, the litter. That's neat. And it's cool to see where they go and, and how they hunt uh, as they grow, too, I'm sure. You know, it, it's, it's a fascinating thing. When, when I grew up, I mentioned with my uncles, they were the hunters in our family. And and they would they would go out and hunt pheasant on a regular basis. Uh oh, did I lose your will? Oh, I got you here. Okay, good. Um, I was just going to say I got I got a big storm happening at my place here in the mountains. I want to make sure I didn't lose you. Yep, we got, got thunder and lightning, and lightning going like crazy here. But when I, when I hunted with my uncles when I was a kid, and they were they were upland, we'd hunt for chicken and pheasant and, and that kind of thing. But they never hunted over dogs. And and so growing up. I had upland hunted, but I had not hunted over dogs. And so when I became an adult and did that, and you want to talk about anybody out there hunts over dogs, you know how special that is. And I would never, ever hunt without them ever again. And then when they're your dogs and you had a hand in training them and helping them reach their potential. And then uh, the, the buddy of mine that where I got my dog from is in Kansas. I hunt with him quite a bit, kind of north central Kansas. And, uh, his, his dog that I kind of started hunting when I got into setters, I'd hunted over labs for years, but when I hunted over his setter, and I fell in love with the English setter and kind of how they handled themselves in the field, and, and then uh, his dog's last litter only had two pups, two females. He kept one, I kept the other, and so we love to hunt those sisters together, man, and they, you know, all dogs can work as a team, but those two sisters are, I mean, they're just crazy how they work together, and, and uh, so now this come fall, we're going to have not only sisters, but we're going to have uh, daughters 
and one son, in fact, because we had one boy and four girls in this litter. And so, yeah, it, I think that's just any hunt, you begin to appreciate that. I say all the time, Will, there are times I don't care if I, if I shoot a bird or not. I just love watching the dogs, man. The way they, the way they, you know, they, they track down points and then they honor each other. I mean, it's something spectacular. And that, that for me is about 95% of the enjoyment. And is this uh, something and, and, and bird hunting? Is this something new that you've uh, picked up recently with your with your recent pups, uh, or is this uh, kind of lifelong thing that's always been been lingering in the background? Well, it, it was something like I said I did as a kid, um, and then got away from it, and, and because I was moving around the country, but raising so I wasn't you know ra- raising the hunting um, dogs and, in particular. Oh yeah, well yeah, that that's new for me. Yeah, I've never done that. Uh, that was something when I met uh, my buddy out in Kansas. Oh, I think it was six years ago. He and I finally connected. And, and that's one of those uh, great media stories, by the way. I'm doing a game one night, and we did a Friday night college football game. We're wrapping things up. My partner's Gary Barnett, the great coach. And because we got a Saturday off, because we're doing a Friday night game, I said, uh, Coach, you going to be golfing tomorrow? And go off tomorrow. And he said, you're, you're going to go hunt some geese, huh? And I said, yeah. And he goes, well, good luck with the hunt. <laughs> well, this guy in Kansas who's a big Colorado guy shoots me an email. The next day, it says, hey, I understand you like to hunt, man. i got plenty of ground you can hunt if you're interested in hunting pheasant and quail. And I'm like, well, you don't get those kind of offers every day. And so I said, sure. Well, the guy turns out we're the same age. Uh, he grew up here in Colorado. He's a huge buff fan. And he's lived out in Kansas for, I don't know, 35 years or something. And, and uh, he was the one, like I said, that had the setters that got me in the setters. And then I got one of his pups. And, and that's where this whole thing has taken off. And it's kind of added a whole new layer, like you talked about, with with uh, upland hunting for me and, and made it that much more enjoyable because like I said, you hunt over your own dogs and watch them and see how they grow and develop. And, and then, you know, watch this fall, we'll take these pups now that we have, and I'm keeping one of my litter. Um, and so you know, she'll be seven, eight months by the time we get around the season and we'll go on out there and her mother and technically her aunt will kind of teach her on a field, on, you know, on top of the work that I'll do with her all summer long and, and so it's just it's just fantastic to watch, and I, like like I said, it it adds a, a whole new aspect of it that to me is more enjoyable than the actual shooting of a pheasant. I yeah, mean, you know, amazing. well, I like bring home some meat, no doubt about that. Yeah, but but just watching those dogs has really become a, a thrill for me. And uh, it ties in, I would imagine, at least a little bit. Uh, you know, similarly uh, uh, to your your passion of being a horseman and and uh, yep. and uh, you know looking after and, and taking care and, and teaching and and uh, growing with the animals. I mean, where where did your passion for horses come and, and where are you at with horses right now? How many do you have and when? Kind of what's the background there? Well, uh, growing up where I did in a farming ranching community up in North Dakota. Um, we had horses, and my dad didn't like horses, but we boarded horses. And my dad did that, living on the farm, just to make extra money. And he, like I said, he thought he thought the horse was about the, the worst preacher that the good Lord ever created. I fell in love with them. <clears throat> I was fascinated by them and how they, you know, how you interact with them. And I didn't understand anything. I'm just a kid. But what would happen is, you know, I'd clean stalls and, and help out. And then as I got a little bit older, we used to have some of our boarders would ask, Asked my dad, is there anybody here that could ride, you know, kind of work out, if they didn't get out there very often to, to ride their own horse, could maybe work out a horse or two. Well, I'm a kid, and, you know, my dad's like, oh, know, my son can. So I, I you know, I, I barely knew which end to feed, which end to clean up after. But I was jumping on those horses and, and riding them, not knowing a thing about what I was doing. And so it kind of created this, this interest for me. <coughs> and uh, again, moving around the country like I did, my job. I kind of got away from that kind of thing for many, many years. And then here in Colorado, we bought a place up in the mountains, and I've got a little property up here and wanted to get back into back into horses at some point. And so we did. I've got two sitting uh, just outside where I'm right now. My barn's right back here. I've got a couple of horses right now. And uh, ironically, I've got one that's being picked up in Idaho tomorrow. I just purchased oh, a wow. new horse. That's, yeah. So uh, he'll be a four-year-old here in June. And he's a very large, I'm a big guy. You know that. You've met me. I'm a large man. I need a pretty good sized horse. And so he's, he's about 16 hands high, about 1,250 pounds. And he's a young horse. And, and I team rope. Uh, I've gotten into that here in recent years. And that was just something that I was fascinated with and kept thinking, I want to try that. and Never did. And uh, I'm not sure I recommend jumping into that in your 50s, but that's what I've done. And, and uh, I've gotten into it and just fell in love with it. So he'll kind of be my, 
secondary roping horse, and I'll work on him and kind of train him, and, and uh, we'll get him ready. And then, uh, you know, this I do a 100-mile wilderness ride every summer, late July, where I go out and ride 100 miles with, with a group of guys, and, and that's coming up, and so I've got that coming up. So, yeah, I've just about the training aspect. And, and Will, I've always been fascinated by the, the training aspect of horses and, and dogs. And there are some similarities there uh, in terms of how you approach that. Uh, you know, horses are a prey animal. So their entire existence has to do with self-preservation. And, and so there becomes a partnership. The great trainer Ray Hunt once said, show me a man's horse and I'll tell you about the man because hmm. they're, they're a reflection of you. The better you become, the better your horse becomes. And, and so that's been always a fascinating aspect of this for me. And, and then I've taken that and, and some of those same concepts and, and apply them to the dogs that I train. And, and it's, it's fascinating to me because, you know, you, there, there's an old philosophy I, I've, I've kind of stumbled upon, you know, for a dog or a horse, you make it easy to do what you want them to do. And you make it hard for them to do what they want to do. Sure. And, and, yeah, and, and it's, a, it's a fascinating kind of, and, you know, we've it's, all it's been same... around bad situations or seen bad situations animals to do something. And I don't think you can do that. You have to partner with them and kind of give them options and help them decide in the right direction. So that, that's been a fascinating aspect of dogs and horses for me over the years. Same way for humans, right? If you're trying to break a habit, you know... Uh... Uh, you get you you know the more friction you have the 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 less likely you are to do it the less friction you have the more likely you are to slip into that old habit right yeah that's right you know with horses we talk about pressure right you 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 help them find the release for pressure um if you want to soften when we talk about <clears throat> excuse me a horse softening you know that that's kind of help them they're not stiff in the neck and, and kind of pushing at the bit and and so you want them to soften it so you you apply pressure you you help them you give them that pressure to kind of, you want them to come back in, into their body and you kind of hold them there until they figure out, oh, if I give my head, that pressure's released. And it, you kind of, all you do is help them find the answer. Right. Um, you can't force it. And I find that with, you know, I got these two dogs that, because I'm going to deliver one to my friend. And, and uh, I told him the other day, I said, I'll deliver in two weeks. Your dog's going to be potty trained. And his wife was like, oh, I, that's not possible. I'm like, oh, baloney. I, I've, it's been three days, and, and so far, two dogs, we've had one accident in the house because <laughs> there's a process to it. You teach them how to do it. You make them understand. My neighbors think I'm crazy, I think, half the time because, you know, I go outside, and one of the dogs goes pee or, or poops out there, and I celebrate like I just won the World Series, right, because I'm <laughs> that positive. And I do it here. That's a great thing. If I make a mistake in the house, you know, he tells me very sternly no, he doesn't like that. And so, you know, it's just that positive reinforcement. Like I said, you're right. It works on horses, works on dogs, and it actually works on, on people as well. <laughs> That's great. Uh, what's, what's the 100-mile ride? I know uh, I, I've heard about this over the years that you've been doing it, uh, but I don't know much about it. I know it's, uh, it's a crew of you guys who kind of goes out into the mountains and uh, all you yeah. saddle up and go for this ride. So tell me a little bit about that. Well, it's an organization called the Roundup Riders of the Rockies, and it's been around 75 years. In fact, this is our 75th year uh, this year. And it's a, an organization uh, that was created to promote the Western way of life and horsemanship. And so that's a huge part of it. You have to be invited to be part of this, and you have to be a certain level of horseman. Because if you're going to go out, and, and we do it up and down the Rocky Mountain region, so it's not always the same spot. Uh, this year, we're up in kind of the Wyoming, Colorado border up in that area. And we go up, and it's a pretty large group of guys. And we get together, and we ride. Uh, we get uh, come in on a Thursday night. Friday is kind of a, hey, good to see everybody and, and, you know, enjoy everybody a little bit and kind of get your horses ready. Saturday and Sunday and Monday, we ride 20, 20, 20. So three consecutive days, we ride 20 miles. Uh, Tuesday, then, we take the day off and have a, just a fun day. We do a little – we bring, uh, bring our shotguns with – um, we have a couple of horse competitions that we do, little skill competitions, a little, little rodeo type deal, uh, if you will. And, and so we have some fun with that and, and uh, eat some good food and have some uh, tell some lies and have some laughs, that kind of thing. <laughs> and then Wednesday, Thursday, we ride 20 and 20 again. And then we wrap it up. And Thursday night, we have a little banquet to kind of wrap up our time together. And, and uh, we move our camp. So every night we, we get up in the morning, we take down our tents. We got a crew that comes along and helps. But we take down our tents and, 
get everything packed up, and then whatever's left over, the crew kind of kind of takes care of, and then they move on to the next campsite, if you will. And uh, we do our 20 miles and meet them there, and they've, they've already set up the big top tent and all of our tents, and we have that that night of, of fellowship and kind of do the same thing again the next day. So it it's a heck of a deal, and it's a great organization. I love what it stands for. Uh, all the things that we're kind of losing in this country that, you know, the Western heritage and, and certainly there aren't that many people riding horses anymore either. No. So I, I really enjoy it. Yeah. It, it's quite a treat. Will. It, it yeah. it's every year, the last week of July, especially riding in the woods too. And, and, and in the mountains, you know, there's certainly a lot of people still rodeoing and, yeah. and riding around their farms, but uh, yeah, yeah, to go on a, on a wild wilderness ride like that, uh, yeah, that seems awesome. And I'm imagining like, uh, you know, canvas tents and uh, uh, kind of the whole, if you got the horse, you might as well bring uh, bring what you can, right? Oh, yeah. You got your bedroll and, and all that. And, you know, let you give you an idea. Uh, last year, we rode between 9,000 and 13,000 feet. We were way up in the Rocky Mountains. Jeez, those horses and are so probably here working. you are the last week of July. Oh, yeah. We are, here we are the last week of July, and we faced rain. We faced hail. We had snow. Uh, while we were riding, um, there were some days that the high temperature was about 43 degrees, you know, in late July. So we were we were up there in the, in the Rocky Mountains. And so uh, it's, it's really cool. You know, there's uh, there's obviously a lot of preparation, a lot of planning goes in. Uh, you deal a lot with, uh, you know, national uh, grasslands and, or, or I beg your pardon, uh, national parks. Because sometimes we we'll ride through public lands. Uh, you, you deal with uh, BLM, you know, uh, you got to deal with them a lot. Uh, and so the guys that, that prepare this thing for us and the route you're going to take. And then they go out and ride it a number of times to make sure they can get through. And there's a crew that goes out and actually uh, packs in chainsaws and cuts whatever wow. wood they've got us so we can get on through where we're at. And so it's a heck of a process. I'm, I'm involved more from uh, an organizational standpoint back here. I'm never out, you know, kind of preparing to trail that kind of thing. And, but yeah, it's a lot of work, but it's, it's, a, it's an adventure. I, I said last year, I was speaking to the group and I said, uh, this is a, Every year, once in a lifetime experience. <laughs> That's awesome. And it, which is an odd way of saying it, but but we say we see places will that ninety nine point nine percent of the population will never see because you're you're in so remote. And there are times where you know two, three, four days in a row we won't see another human being out there. It's we'll see bear and we'll see moose and elk and everything else, but you're not going to see any people because you're that far in the middle of the wilderness. Yeah, and the advantage with the horses, I have to imagine as well, is that you know you're going places that aren't motorized. So really the only way to get that deep is on a horse because yep. somebody can't backpack in there, uh, you know, th th at that pace f with the horses. So yeah, you really are seeing some untouched stuff. I have to imagine. And, and by the way, uh, you know, there, there are accidents. If you've got that many horses, you, you're going to have accidents. We we've, we've had in my, let's see, what have I done this now? Is it six years? Um, we, we've had flight for life come in a few times and, and take a few guys out because, you know, we've had some bad wrecks. And, and you know, that, that's part of it as well. When, when you're dealing with horses, you're dealing with that many horses, things can get congested. There have been problems, and we've had guys get hurt pretty good because we've had some blow-ups on horses in the middle of nowhere. And, and so uh, you're getting on the sat phone and making a phone call out and giving your coordinates, and, you know, they're flying in to pick somebody up. And so, you know, it's, it's uh, a lot of fun, and it's a great adventure. And there's some danger involved as well, obviously. I mean, it's or something like that, but uh, which is why you, you better, better be a pretty good kind of thing. You, you better understand what you're dealing with because, you know, even with uh, all those skills, a lot of experience, you know, bad things can still happen when you ride a 1,200 pound animal. Sure. Yeah, I can believe that. I got to imagine there's some characters in that crew, huh? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, there are, you know. And, and what's, what's neat about the group is. You've got just about what whatever specialty you're interested in in the world. We've got captains of industry. We've got doctors. We've got scientists. We've got military guys. I think I'm the only broadcaster involved, but we've got <laughs> men from every walk of life you can possibly imagine. And so no matter, we were joking last year because, you know, the things got so crazy weather-wise and logistically. And I, I said to somebody, I said, you know, this group's fascinating because there are so many guys here. And no matter what we run into, somebody is going to have some expertise, whatever we need. <laughs> and, and so when we have got guys get hurt, we got, you know, five or six doctors there. They all take care of everything and, and tend to the guy until, you know, the helicopter flies in or whatever it might be. And we've got, uh, we've got military special forces guys who, when it comes to getting those helicopters in there, because they, 
They're telling them, here's where the coordinates are, and they've all dealt with this kind of stuff before. It's really a fascinating just experience just to watch how everything unfolds and all the different yeah. personalities and, and skill sets that are involved. Sounds like a lot of logistics, too, with that many people, for sure. Yes. Yep. How about uh, how about the rodeo stuff? Uh, I know you've also been getting more involved. I don't know if that started obviously in maybe in uh, in North Dakota, but uh, I'm sure some of the broadcasting kind of helped spur maybe some reinvolvement with you because I know you do a lot of broadcasting uh, or calling for some of the radio uh, announcing. What's your uh, radio or rodeo involvement? And, and tell me a little bit about uh, roping. Well, from from an announcing standpoint. Um... I don't. I put a great emphasis on that, but I get asked to do a number of events every year. And uh, there's especially a, an organization called American Bullfighting. If you've ever seen that, uh, you throw those guys out there and they just, you know, if you've ever seen bull riding and you know how the bullfighters will protect the riders, okay, a lot of people have seen that kind of thing. There's a competition for those guys. And I've gotten hooked up with an organization called American Bullfighting. And they got one of the top guys, the guy that owns the organization, a guy named Kevin Rich. And his son, Roper, is one of the top bullfighters in America. And, and so uh, I do a number of events for Kevin every summer. And, and, and different rodeos will call me up just out of the blue and say, hey, we're in need of somebody helping out. So for me, that's just fun because I've always enjoyed that rodeo world with the competition. And not that I've ever been good enough to compete <laughs> and be an athlete in a rodeo. But at least I can be up there and, and announce some of that stuff. And so that's always fun for me to, to do a little bit of that. Now, the roping thing, you know, like I said, it was, I was always fascinated by it. And I thought, man, I'd like to try that sometime. And, uh, you know, I know you've got to be a good horseman. Your, your riding's got to be solid. you got to be able to control your horse and control yourself so your horse doesn't, doesn't feed off of you. And then, you know, I, I always explain it to people this way. You've got two 1,200-pound horses, two 200-pound men. You've got a 500-pound steer. You're flying down the arena at about 35 miles an hour, swinging two ropes, and you got to grab that steer front and back and, and, you know, stretch them out. There's a lot that can go wrong in that set of <laughs> circumstances, like right? There's a lot, lot of variables in there, Will. <laughs> and so when I got into it here a few years ago, my first summer, I embarrassed myself all summer long. I mean, I, I could – it was – you know how they say, you know, you that tough thing where tapping your head and rubbing your belly, right? <laughs> That's essentially what you're doing. You're riding with your left hand. You're riding and riding your horse. You're swinging the rope, and everything's got to be timed out perfectly, and you got to know when to throw the loop and, and all that. So it's been a great learning experience. Uh, last season, I actually competed in a few jackpots. I did all right. You know, I got <laughs> when I first started. Uh, one of the guys I was working with asked me, said, what's your goal? What do you want to do? And I said, I want to get into a jackpot roping. I want to compete and look like I belong there. And so the first jackpot I jumped into – there's a young guy who's a heck of a roper. I mean, high level guy. And he looked at me one day and he said, you know, you're ready. And I said, I don't think so. He goes, no, no, I'm telling you, you're ready. And so we went out and we jumped into a jackpot roping and I went on out and uh, caught my first three steers. It came down to the fourth one. If I catch it, I'm in the money. If I miss, I'm out of the money. I, I came home with no money that day. I missed my fourth <laughs> one, but, but I was there and I looked like I belonged and, and so I, I've kind of fallen in love with that and just get a big kick out of it. That's neat. And so was this at just a, a specific event for roping, or would this be a re, you know regular Friday night rodeo that you just entered in? Well, this one, uh, the, the, the stuff I got involved with was jackpots. And so there's a few okay. uh, around I, this region, there are these jackpot ropes. Well, really all over the West, they're jackpot ropings. And what they are, that's just kind of an open deal. Now, there's a governing body for roping. You've got to be a member of that. But sure. what they do, they score you. Uh, and, and give you a number, and that tells what people what level you are, okay? okay. Uh, a guy like me, I'm a three, okay? I'm a, that's a low-level guy. Guys that uh, rope with the National Finals Rodeo in Las Vegas, they're eights, nines, and tens. I mean, they're top-level guys. Okay. And so and they do that to kind of handicap how these how these these things work. And so uh, I went and jumped into a few of those. There's a arena here in the Denver metro area that I can go on out to, and they – they have ropings, roping jackpots on Wednesdays and Saturdays, I think it is. And so I just went on out there and competed with some guys and, and had a good time. Hey, I'm not going to end up in Las Vegas, I can tell you that. But uh, <laughs> it, awesome. it's, it's a lot of fun. It, you know, every once in a while, there are days, it's, it's like anything else, though, Will. Like, there are some days I go on out there, and I, I, I practice during the summer. I rope twice a week. And then in the winter, uh, there's a, an indoor arena I go to, and we've got a kind of a little club, if you will. We limited to 10 guys at each end, headers and healers. And we get together every Tuesday night. We rope all winter long. Um, 
And so uh, it's it's just a lot of fun, and and uh, it's it's something I'll keep doing as long as I can. And so, forgive me for being naive, but what is the uh, where does roping come from? Uh, to you're you're getting a calf down to uh, to brand it, or what's the what's the story behind roping? Yep, it is branding season. I've been at a couple of brandings this year, but yeah, it's you're you're going Doctor Cats, right? And so where it came from, and all the events in rodeo came from you know, real cowboys who were out working cattle and, and, you know, events came from that. And so the roping was just simply, if you're out in a pasture somewhere, you're going to go out, you're going to rope the calf and you want to lay it over, right? So you rope the head and you rope the heels and you stretch it out. And that way you, you can lay that calf down and you can brand it and doctor it. And so that's where it came from. And and that's how that, that event, you know, came to be. And, and then somebody uh, like it, like Cowboys simply uh, always want to do, they got to compete at something, right? So they said, you know what, I think I can do that quicker than you can. And, <laughs> and so that's where it comes from. And so it's a timed event. And I, I'm on the head side. And so uh, you're either a header or a healer. And, and your what job are, is the header. You come and, and, and what, you what know, would you, you, what would make somebody a header versus a healer? Well, uh, for any of your, your viewers that know anything about roping, I think I always tell people it's because I'm better looking and smarter than the guys that are healers. That's that's why I become a header. That's what I tell everybody. Um, but it's, it's just a skill set. So for me, I'm the guy that comes down. I rope the head. And then what you do, you rope it, you dally it on your saddle horn, and you wait for that. You get that head turned, and then you, you make a left-handed turn then. And when you do that, you get control of that head, and that steer starts jumping. It starts hopping like this. And that then gives the healer who comes in from behind the timing. He then ropes the two back feet, and you stretch it out. And uh, that's the way the timing works. There's a judge at, a, at an event like that. He's got his flag, and he's sitting there. And I rope, and I turn it, and the healer comes in. We stretch it out, and then I've got to finish with my horse has to be facing my the steer right so i get to the end and i turn that horse and i'm facing we got that steer stretched out and he drops his flag that's when the timing stops hmm. and uh uh you know those guys in the nfr they'll do it in about four seconds and i do it in about uh eight nine ten eleven twelve depending on and you know but uh, we have a good time with it that's neat that's neat we started off with uh with your hunting dogs so what's your uh what's your hunting uh you know What's your favorite way to hunt? It sounds like obviously Upland uh, uh, is up there if you're doing the dogs, but uh, what, what type of hunting do you like and, and what's kind of your uh, your background growing up with hunting? Well, growing up with my uncles, they, they did a lot of deer hunting, whitetail up in, up in North Dakota, Minnesota, where I grew up. And so that was a big thing for them. A lot of, lot of uh, waterfowl, you know, ducks and geese, they did a lot of that. We did some Upland stuff uh, when I was a kid as well. Um, it, it's hard for me to do big game stuff because I'm doing college football and, and, you know, my weekends are always booked all fall long and I do get out and do a little deer and elk, but for me, it's, it's day hunts. You know, I, I, I'd have a tough time, if, you know, going up someplace and spending five, six days up in the mountains looking for elk. I just can't do that. And so I'll get out. I've got a couple of friends in the area. that have got some property where I can go and, and just, you know, I'll, I'll get a tag and Go out and see if I can get something one day and doesn't work out. Maybe two weeks later, I got another day I can sneak on out. So that, that's about what my big game hunting uh, involves. Uh, the upland stuff is something I've really fallen in love with. I, I enjoy the heck out of that. You know, it's you know when, when you're hunting big game, it's a process, right? I mean, every, anybody who's ever done it, it's it's work. You know, you're traveling someplace, you're you know hiking in, you're bringing gear in. Uh, it's all fun and games till you shoot something, and the real work gets underway. Of course, you know what you got to pack everything out, and so uh, I, I, for me, it's it's being a bit more nimble, doing the upland stuff has been a big thing for me. So I love that. I get out and do some waterfowl on on a semi regular basis. I've got some guys that have some property along the, the Platte River here in Colorado, and I can get on out and shoot some ducks and geese every once in a while. And and then for me, I love spring turkey. Uh, I'm a big spring turkey guy. Now I will tell you this. Uh, raising puppies this spring, cut into my turkey hunting uh -oh. quite a bit this year. But yeah, but I do love getting out and doing spring turkey. That that's me. I I did not do that as a kid, and I got into it. Oh heck, I'm gonna guess probably about 15 years ago. I started turkey hunting for the first time and, and just fell in love with it. And and I've been playing around with a bow the last couple of years. I've, I've never been a bow guy, but I got into bow hunting the last few years, and I'm still waiting to actually harvest something with my bow. <laughs> but uh, I'm getting pretty good. Uh, Kind of back behind my place, working on my target back here, and, and it'll come at some point in time. But that, that's that's pretty much what I like to hunt right there. So upland, a little waterfowl, 
a day or two with some big game stuff, and then my spring turkey. That, that about covers it for me. Well, you sound like a bow hunter. Uh, great at the target, but haven't harvested much. <laughs> <laughs> well, you, and, and, you know, I've got some friends of mine that are turkey hunters with a bow, which just stuns me, you know? Uh, you know, you know, you know the way they kind of guillotine the way that they work with those things. I'm like, dude, I, I have a tough enough time to they could hear and see to get one with a shotgun. How the heck am I going to get one with a bow? So I, I played around with that. I haven't even come close with a turkey yet, but I've tried a few times with elk and deer. And, you know, just had shots I wasn't quite comfortable with, maybe a little bit outside of my range, so I didn't take them. But uh, it, it's fun to kind of experience something new. Hey, it's Will here. Want to take a moment to let you know about today's sponsor, SREgear.com. SRE Gear is a family-owned and operated outdoor gear shop in Black River Falls, Wisconsin, and they have everything you need for your next adventure, whether you're camping, backpacking, hiking, paddling, or just getting out there and exploring. SREgear.com has the gear you need to get you to those places you love. I recently picked up a new Garmin InReach from SRE. I needed a new communication device for the guided canoe trips I've been leading. And after talking through a few options with the owner, Nick, there, he helped me sort out what I needed and get squared away. And that's one of the things that sets SREgear.com apart is the unbeatable customer service. Call or email with any questions and you'll talk with the owner, Nick, or someone there close to him. So before you go and buy any outdoor equipment from a big box store, be sure to check out family-owned and operated SREgear.com. And be sure to use the discount code WILL at checkout for 10% off your first purchase. That's discount code WILL at checkout for 10% off. SREgear.com. Great gear, great prices, unbeatable customer service. Hey, it's Will here. I want to take a moment to let you know about our show sponsor and partner, Fischel Paddles, makers of fine handcrafted wooden canoe paddles. I spent a lot of time paddling rivers and lakes, and Fischel Paddles are the best canoe paddles that I've come across. I use the Ray Special model myself, and I outfit all the guided trips that I run with Fischel Paddles too, because I think they're the best. Each paddle is handmade by Greg Fischel at his shop in Flagstaff, Arizona from a single piece of wood. What I love most is the shape and feel of the paddle. Other than being beautiful and efficient, it puts less strain on your shoulders and arms than a typical paddle would while actually giving you more control and finesse with each stroke. Plus, the shape of the blade just feels right cutting through the water. All paddles are customizable from the type of wood, whether that's cherry, ash, or maple, to laser engravings. And my favorite, which is the leather strap that Greg pins around the shaft so that it doesn't get beat up as you run along the gunnels, prying off or doing the J-stroke in the back of the stern there. So go get yourself a Fischel paddle now and feel the difference. Use the code WILL at checkout. That's W-I-L-L to get a free wooden paddle hanger with any paddle purchase. That way you can show off and organize that new handmade paddle. Check them out at FischelPaddles.com. That's F-I-S-H-E-L-L Paddles.com. Fischel Paddles, handcrafted wooden canoe paddles. What do you have uh, to offer in Colorado and, and, and Kansas and some of the nearby places as far as Upland? Uh, pheasant, obviously, I imagine, is the big one. Is there other things that you chase? Well, in, in, in Kansas, um, where I go out there in, in north central, that's kind of around the Osborne, Smith County area uh, where I generally get out to. And, and out there, it's a lot of uh, pheasant and quail. This is primarily what we hunt out there. Um, here in Colorado, you know, the pheasant hunting hasn't been great, although the last couple of years has gotten a little bit better. And I mentioned a while ago, I get out and help uh, a couple of my buddies, ranchers who, who uh, you know, have cattle, I go out and help them brand it so I can go out and jump on their property. And, and you know, I'll, 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 I'll harvest a few birds every year here in, in Colorado. But um, the old timers here in Colorado will tell you the pheasant hunting, you know, 35, 40 years ago was a whole lot better than it is right now. And I think drought has a big uh, impact upon that, obviously. So I'll get out and do some pheasant hunting here. I haven't seen many quail here in Colorado. Uh, a few prairie chickens every once in a while, uh, but yeah, that's that's primarily it. Um, I don't, you know, when I was up in in uh, North Dakota as a kid, we hunted a lot of grouse up there. You know, that was that was kind of a big deal. Pheasant, grouse, and it was kind of what I hunted when I was a kid. Um, but uh, you don't see much of that here. Now you get up in Wyoming a little bit, you see some grouse up there. I know I got some friends that will do that quite a bit. I've done that a time or two. So it's. Uh, and then, they, you know, there's a, the, the, some of these mountain grouse, these blue grouse. I mean, I've been thinking right. I want to maybe try that at some point in time. Um, I've never done it. I've got friends that do it. Uh, I still haven't even seen one, to be honest with you. I live up in the mountains and still haven't seen one. And so I'd like to give that a shot at some point in time. I'm looking for someone that knows that, that type of hunting a little better than I do to kind of help me out with that. I hear you. I hear you. Yeah, I, uh, there, there's all kinds of, uh, you know, those, those different uh, – 
species that you know you don't think of and actually um i just so i have a uh here on the farm in illinois uh we got a ton of coyotes uh just tons and tons of coyotes here sure. near the pig farm and uh i got a couple guy guys that come out and hunt coyotes but uh we don't have many deer but i just saw uh i mowed uh one of our berms the other day and it was the first mow of the season it had been real long for a long time and I uh, I found an egg and I was wondering now what could this be and I looked at it and you know it, was, it looked about the size of a chicken egg and I got to thinking you know what yeah. I think that's a pheasant egg and sure you know sure enough I googled it and looked it up and spitting an image and I'm like huh there you go we got we got pheasants here wow. at the farm and I'd seen a couple uh, in years past but uh, just very rare um, so who knows hopefully we'll have some some more running around but I think it's it's tough with the coyotes around because we got we got a lot of them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They, you know, coyote. You know, I, I've done some coyote hunting over the. You know, I, I've gone out after predators a few times. I've gone mountain lion hunting, and I've, I, and obviously I've gotten out a few times and and uh, run into some coyotes. And you know, they're they're the uh, rats of the prairie, as you well know. And oh, so yeah. it's I don't ever feel bad taking them. And and but uh, I've got a buddy of mine that does quite a bit of that. So I've gone a couple of times with him. You know, calling them in and. And it's always amazing to me with coyotes, you can call them in and you take one and literally two minutes later, another one comes walking in. You take, it's like, it, it's stunning how they will just continue to come pouring in. And if you're in an area like you are where there are a lot of boy, it's, you can, you can kind of help things because they can be a pest uh, certainly. And I, you know, I see them around my property every once in a while. I've taken a few right up here, just got to kind of clean them out a little bit because they, they do get into, there are neighbors. I don't have chickens myself, but uh, it, it's a pretty regular occurrence. Some of my neighbors up here, I have their chickens gotten into by the coyotes and bears at, at different times. But, uh, yeah, it, it's kind of a fun little hunt every once in a while to go out and take some coyotes. Absolutely. How about the wildlife up at your place? I know you're kind of tucked away up there, uh, up there in the, in the foothills or in the mountains. Uh, what, uh, what do you have running around up there? You see any mountain lions ever or bear, or, uh, I know you got elk up there, I assume. Yep. Yep. Uh, mainly I'm high enough where, um, we get in the in the summers. We get so about this time of year, we get some some bachelor bulls will come up here. We see them quite a bit. Uh, they'll come roaming through our property quite a bit up here, and we got a lot a lot of mule deer. I mean, they're you know they're everywhere up here. And when you have mule deer, of course, you're going to have mountain lion, right? You got deer, you're going to have mountain lion. And uh, in fact, just this morning on a little uh, online community bulletin board up here. Somebody mentioned that they just had their cat taken just two nights ago. Jeez. Uh, cat got out, and the guy stepped outside his house and was calling it and saw a flash off to the right, and it was a mountain lion was running by and grabbed his cat and took it. So, <laughs> oh, yeah, we've got mountain lion. I've seen them quite frequently. Uh, it was One night I was coming home, Will, from a basketball game. Oh, I think it was probably February, pretty late at night, 11, 30, 12 o'clock at night I was coming home. And uh, the road I'm on kind of, you know, switchbacks coming up the mountain I live on. And I made a turn, and he ran right in front of me. Mountain lion ran, big one, ran right in front of me. And we had just gotten snow, and I thought, I was just down from my house. I thought, I, he might have come right through my property. And so when I got up to my place pulling in the driveway, I stopped. It was shining the lights down the driveway, and I got it looked. And sure enough, he had walked right down my driveway, right through my property, went right by my horses, and uh, went down where I, where I nearly hit him down there. And so Jeez. we get a lot of mountain lion up here. Uh, we get a lot of, lot of bears. Uh, I mentioned my neighbor, uh, he's got chickens. He's had a, had a little bear problem here just about a month ago, got in his chickens and created all sorts of havoc for him. And so a lot of black bear around here. And uh, you mentioned the elk and the deer. And, and so we see a lot of that and coyote and, and, uh, and fox, that kind of thing. But uh, that, that's, that's primarily. And I, I should tell you this, too. I've run into moose a few times above my place uh, when I'm on horseback riding. Uh, we, we're moose. just off of National Forest where I'm at. In fact, last fall... I was uh, up, uh, was it this time of year? It's about, about this time of year, I'm guessing. Uh, maybe maybe a little bit later. I was up there, ran into a, a cow. That one, I, I run into bulls up there as well, but ran into a cow moose, and she had a, a young one with her, and she got up and charged me on my horse. Uh, I, I was trying oh, to give cow. her a wide breath, and I'm you know, 60, 70 yards off of her and just trying to kind of work my way around where she was, but she didn't like me being there. She got up and took off after me and so we see moose here every once in a while as well. well that sounds like quite the encounter <laughs> it, it was it was a little nerve-wracking you know i mean and she, she was pretty upset that i was in the area and so she got up and turned and came running at me and i spun that horse around and went back the other direction and and uh, got away from it but uh 
Yeah. So we, we see, I, I've seen, oh, I'm trying to think here. When I first got up in this area, and I've lived up here for 17 years. I don't remember seeing moose at all. Hmm. But within the last five or six years now, I've had probably, oh, I'm going to guess seven or eight encounters here in the last uh, five, six years. That's neat. And so it's it's been more and more common. They've kind of moved into the area. I haven't followed it at all, Mark, since the original stuff came out. But where does Colorado stand with the uh, with the wolf introduction? And how is that stuff all playing out? Well, it's uh, it, depending on what part of the state you're living in, you got a very different opinion of it. Okay, um, those in the Denver and Boulder area seem very fond of the idea of, of bringing wolves back to the state of Colorado. Um, those of us who live in rural areas, and, and being that I, I kind of run in circles with a lot of a lot of you know cattlemen and, and ranchers, uh, they're not terribly excited about it for obvious reasons. And uh, you know, predation problems have already happened around the states. And, and uh, there's a buddy of mine that's got a ranch up north. And uh, he's he's had wolf problems the last few years. You know, they, they always like to tell you that, you know, well, we're, wolves aren't in Colorado. And I always say, well, you know what? They're in Wyoming and don't, they don't know anything about state boundaries. Right? right. They wander on down. And so we've had those issues. But that process for CPW continues. And I know there's a lot of money going into it. And the official reintroduction, I want to say, I want to say either late 23 or early 24. Okay. I think it's when that's technically so happening. Still- memory Still on it's schedule, coming. but but they haven't uh, they haven't reintroduced any as of today. They far yeah, it's, that's my understanding. Yeah, they haven't done that yet, and, and uh, you know, but it's it's kind of like I said, it's kind of a funny deal because the the wolves have been here. You know, a number of years ago, um, I've got a, a young son who's disabled, and, and the, we had a uh, when he was still in school, a bus would come and pick him up right in front of our place up here, and the guy who was his bus driver was a. a heavy duty big time big game hunter uh a lot and one day I, his name was tom and one day i come pushing my son out to get on the bus out there and tom says you had a wolf right down here hmm. and i said you were kidding me and there was not far down but from my place there's a pretty good clearing down there and tom says oh no no uh, i saw him down there i said you sure he wasn't a coyote and he goes no no mark i've been hunting a lot T- tom was an older guy he'd been big game hunting in alaska and wyoming and montana and been all over the place and he said i know a wolf i've, I've seen a wolf many times you had a wolf right down there hmm. and so i we made sure we called cpw and reported that and they said they had a couple other uh reports of it so they've been around um i've never seen one but i know they've been around and now it's you know, going to become official i guess you know i guess apparently having a water on through wasn't enough for everybody we want to make sure they're officially here so it'll happen soon uh, interesting yeah it'd be interesting to I know it's always a political thing too, but yeah, it'll be interesting to see how all that stuff uh, plays out. Uh, what was the uh, what was the mountain lion hunt like, and and how does that go down? And did you have any success? Did you see anything? Did you harvest anything? Well, we uh, I've gone a number of times, and I've been on on, on hunts where we have harvested. Um, the, the The biggest one I was on that that I was the primary hunter on. We uh, it ended up being quite a quite a uh, an experience to be honest with you well we it was a big group of us um and talk i was about, with two other guys talk about working with animals and do- i assume you're using dogs or no yes yeah, yeah. And, oh and yeah so so the whole yeah, deal so, the whole kit and caboodle yeah you know and, and the way that normally worked my, my buddy alex who I, i'd go out with you know he'd give me a call about 10 o'clock and say hey we're gonna get some snow let's go and i said all right what time we meet two o'clock we meet at 2 a.m and uh, he and i meet up the mountain here and We'd head out to these, uh, you know, these areas, these national uh, uh, forests, and, and that sort of thing. And, um, go out and look for tracks. You're right. So you're taking, you're riding these mountain roads and looking for tracks and cutting tracks and see if you let your dogs out and see if they can pick up the scent. And and uh, we had it was it was quite a harrowing experience to be honest with you because I was the primary hunter that day. We got a message from a buddy of his. They had cut some tracks and were on a cat. And so we went on over. Uh, met with them where they were and the dogs took off and we went out and we were splitting in two groups and uh, had gps in the dogs you know we're moving on and on and on um i was by far the oldest guy in the hunt that day and everyone else was in their 20s and at the time i think i was 50 and so we're cruising along and you know you know the way it is when you're in the mountains and you've been you spend a lot of time in the mountains right it's always over the next ridge right right so Oh, the next ridge. We're gonna. Oh, we gotta. So you climb and you go down. And, oh no, it's the next ridge. And and so we were playing that game and uh, we were climbing up and I got separated. I fell behind the group a little bit, and I got separated. And it turned out to be kind of a harrowing experience. Now here was the thing: those guys were just over the next ridge, and 
I started thinking to myself, you know, we're getting pretty late in the day. And, and we're, we're out here quite a ways, man. And I, I knew we're, you know, I, I, like a lot of us that go out in the wilderness, right? You're making your mental notes and you got, uh, you know, your equipment with you and your gear. And, and I'm like, okay, well, I know where I'm, I need to get back to fellas. It's getting too late. And, and, uh, I got separated from them and I didn't realize where they were. They actually had the cat treed right down below the next ridge below where, where I was, where I was, uh, had come to a stop. And so at that point in time, I thought, um, I don't know where they're at. Uh, we got separated. I know I'm kind of on my own right now. I need to get back to where we parked. And it was a number of miles back, and it was late in the afternoon in, J- in January, and it was extremely cold. And so I, I started working back, and, and it was, ended up being kind of a harrowing experience. That was the one time in all the years I've been out in the wilderness where I kind of wondered, I might not make it out of here. Hmm. And and it and, got a little, little hairy for me, and, and, and it got, got quite serious. I eventually made it, and uh, – uh, I fell into a river on my way back. Oh, uh, I went through the ice. Yeah, one of those kind of deals. Oh, that's and, like worst case scenario, right? Oh yeah, no, it was it was bad. And but you know, and you know this but with all the stuff you've done. Any of us who do that kind of thing, we we study, we train, we uh, try to be prepared when you go out there because we know that bad things can happen when you're out in the wilderness. And so there was a situation where if, if I had just been some average Joe that had never done that kind of thing, I probably don't make it out of there. But because of all the years of being involved in this kind of stuff and going back to being a kid with my uncles and them teaching me things and me learning things as an adult and reading and studying and asking questions of other guys, um, despite all the bad things, that just despite me getting separated and falling through the ice in a river, I was able to get out, obviously, and knew where I was going and, and was able to make it back only because of all that preparation. And, and that's why, you know, when, when people, I meet people, they, they talk to me about wanting to get into the outdoors and, and, you know, different aspects of it. And, you know, they say, oh, I want to do that. I would think this weekend I got, I would say, do not do that. Please don't do that. Learn, yeah. start to understand what, what goes, what, kind of equipment do you need what are the skills that you need what are the what's the knowledge you need to go out there and to be able to do that and you know you all know this out here in colorado there are these mountain rescue crews that go out and they every single weekend they are busy because people are not prepared they don't know what they're doing they don't understand um you know how massive it is i always tell people you get out there that night i remember as i'm working my way back i remember thinking i can't believe how small i feel (laughs) yeah because you can get overwhelmed by nature and uh and so it was, you know, that, that was, that was one of the hunts that went on when I was a primary hunter and it got a little crazy out there. My wife was a little angry and didn't want me to go, uh, <laughs> mountain lion hunting anymore, but, uh, I, I didn't go for about two weeks. I went back out on another one, but, uh, uh, yeah, it's, it's that, that's an interesting hunt, you know, cause you got those dogs and those cats and I've been there when they've been harvested and, and it's, it's a heck of an experience. Sounds like, uh, you know, at least th- me thinking about it in my head and just from seeing videos and such sounds like a lot of commotion. It sounds like a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of things going on, a lot of dogs barking, a lot of people running and moving. And, uh, yeah, yeah it seems like oh, qu- yeah. quite the event. It, it can be chaotic. Yeah. When you get that, that cat treed and those dogs are going nuts and I, I've been out there and seen situations then where, that cat will, you know, jump down and get hooked up with those dogs. And I, I've been around where dogs have been lost. I mean, it, it can get chaotic. You're absolutely correct. I mean, you get kind of crazy at different times. What, what happens in that situation? The cat? Well, uh, well, you've got, you know, in, in different states, and different rules in terms of how many dogs you can have out there. And so uh, the one that I saw one time, one dog got hurt. One dog was, was actually killed and in so the process. The, and and so, so the cat is we were up down in the home. tree. And then all of a yep. sudden he's backed into a corner and just decides, all right, I've had enough. I'm coming down and I'm fighting. Yep. That, that's what happened to that one. Yeah. He got <laughs> this one. He didn't actually get really up in a tree. He, got, he went through some, some fallen brush and kind of got trapped in there. And the dogs were surrounding him in there. And, and he was, his thought was, I got to fight out of here. And so, you know, those dogs, I think, I think there was five dogs with us that day, as I recall, but um, they, they surrounded him and he finally said, okay, I got to get out of here. And so he went at him and, and he got one of the dogs pretty good. So, yeah, it can be pretty chaotic. And, you know, then you feel awful because I'll tell you what, you know, just like we're talking about, you know, my hunting dogs, uh, those guys that do that and have those dogs that are trained for that, they feel the same way about those dogs that I do about my dogs. Oh, yeah. And and the owner that day was heartbroken. When one of his favorite dogs, it just went down. And, and uh, yeah, it's, it's kind of a tough deal. 
Yeah, I believe it. So what happens to the cat then? Do we, are you able to get the cat down or is it uh, long gone or? Well, that, that one, that one, uh, he got loose and the dogs, the other dogs continued after him. They treated him not, not very far from where we had the little, little incident right there. And so they had him treat eventually that, that cat was taken. We harvested that cat actually. And, wow. and uh, you know, so you're, you're dealing with uh, one dog that was injured, one dog that's down and, and they we ended up getting that, that cat only about a mile away from where we had that little incident. Holy cow. Uh, I want to talk to you a little bit about fishing and then we'll kind of slowly start to wind her down here. But uh, yeah. what, what, uh, what's your fishing? I mean, in North Dakota, I have to imagine you were throwing line out for walleye and bass or whatever else uh, growing up. And then yep. now in Colorado, you're, uh, you're tossing the fly mostly. Is that uh, a fair synopsis? Yeah, yeah, you know, so yeah, growing up as a kid, um, we, we was, you know, walleye, northern pike, you know, sunfish, bluegills, bass, as you mentioned. I mean, that, that's, that's crappie. Um, you know, we, we fished for that stuff as a kid. That, that's, that was pretty common stuff. When I got out here to Colorado and uh, we bought our place over the mountains, and, you know, there, um, you've got, uh, let's say, you've got Bear Creek runs through Evergreen where I'm at. Um, you've got the Platte River not far from where I am. Um, you know, you get these other streams around here and I'd see these guys out fly fishing and I'm like, man, that's fascinating. Right. And then everyone's seen a river runs through it. Right. The romanticization of, of fly fishing and what that's all about. I'm watching these guys and I'm thinking, man, I'd love to try that sometime. I don't know anything about it. It, it seems like it can be overwhelming in terms of, you know, the entomology and learning the bugs and all this kind of stuff. And, uh, finally one year after a number of years of, of, you know, saying to my wife, man, that looks fun. I want to try that sometime for Christmas. She gave me a gift card to Bass Pro Shop <laughs> and, and I, you know, just, and, and she, she called down and said, Hey, my husband, I want to give him a gift card. He wants to try fly fishing. What would a, you know, moderate price setup be? And, and they gave her a number and she bought the gift card and said, tell me what it was for. So I went down and, and got myself set up and I really didn't know anybody. And so I started asking around a little bit and I met a guy who was a fishing guy. And I explained, here's the situation. I just want to understand what it's about and try and figure it out. So he actually took me out and, and gave me kind of that fly fishing 101. And then in, in the little town in which I live, Evergreen's got a great fly shop, the, the Blue Quill, which has got Pat Dorsey's a, a prominent fly fisherman that people know about. And uh, they, they give some classes. So I went down there and took a class one Saturday just to get the basics of what I need to know. And then I went out, uh, as I typically do, so I got a little bit of knowledge. And I just went out and stood in the river and just trial by error and and will you, you've done it you know i spent more time sitting in the bank untying knots <laughs> and and getting frustrated and oh, trying yeah. to figure out how you know line management all the things you have to do but it was just persistence and wanting to do it and i kept just going out because of where i live i can get on a stream or river pretty quick and i just kept going out and working on it and working on it and working on it and i started reading books and i started watching videos online and and talking to different guys and then i'd get invited to go out with a guy and, and i'd pick his brain for the entire time we were out and so just fell in love with it and you know it's the first guy that i ever went with i mentioned that taught me a little bit he told me he said when you get out there you're either going to love it and it's going to bite you and you'll do it for the rest of your life or you're going to go eh, no big deal and, and maybe never do it again well, so I went out there with that mindset and realized very quickly, you know what? I love this. It's for me, it's, you know, I talked about going out and if I, if I harvest a pheasant, great. If I don't, I'm watching the dogs and have a great time. I've come back. I've gone up on myself in some Canyon somewhere. And I'll come back end of the day. My wife will say, you know, how'd you do? And I go, ah, not too well today. And she will say, I'm sorry. And I said, no, 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 don't be sorry. At the time of my life, yep. I stood out there the good Lord's creation and, uh, you know, which was battling trout. There, there's a there's a great uh, fly fishing writer. He's a legendary figure here in Colorado. His name John Garrich, who writes some fantastic books. Very funny uh, writer. And he's got a line one time that I've always uh, I've always appreciated. He said, "Sometimes it's not that you, the river beats you; it's that the river didn't even know you were there." <laughs> and, and I, when I go out and get skunked, when that happens, it doesn't happen very often. But every once in a while, I think to myself. All right, the river didn't even know I was there today. I got beat. The fish were smarter than I was. Yeah. The river was better than I was, and then I got beat today. But yeah, it's that—that that is one of the great joys of my life. And I, I, uh, I mentioned my son earlier, uh, Jake. Uh, frequently, I go on out and find him a nice spot, you know, on the on the 
on the bank of the river and I'll set him up with a chair and with a cold drink and a little shelter there, a little umbrella with the top of it. I'll go down and, and fish the river down in front of me, the direction for a few hundred yards for a few hours. And that's a pretty darn good afternoon here in the state of Colorado. I can tell you that. Absolutely. I'm right there with you, Mark. Yeah. And, uh, it's funny thinking back to that, uh, for me at least, to that learning stage. It was when I was in Boulder, the same time I was uh, uh, you know, running around with you and, and Andy Lindahl. Um, and when I was in college there, uh, I had a, I think it was a three-weight, a little three-weight that I had that I'd run in between classes uh, yep. on campus there and right on Boulder Creek, I'd, you know, string up my three weight, uh, for little brown trout <laughs> right in Boulder Creek in between the class. And yeah, exactly. Like you said, just persistence of figuring it out. And I remember those, like, uh, you know, those moments where it clicked and it came together and it was like, uh, you know, you took a big step forward, like, you know, learning the, uh, the hopper dropper and how to tie the dropper on the, the first fly. It was like, a <laughs> just a game changer for me. And, and, uh, yeah, it's fun yeah. thinking about those, but then at the same time, when I go with somebody who is less experienced than me, I, I always, I almost want to like help them through it because I don't want to see them suffer through the wind knots and just yes. getting skunked all the time. But I, it's part of it. If, if you're going to stick with it, you know? Oh, without question. I'll tell you a great story. So, uh, a, a friend of mine calls me one day, and he said, hey, w- would you take my son out fishing? And I said, certainly I would. And, and so uh, his name's Jeff and, and his son, and they came out. His son was, oh, I want to say was 12, I think, at the time. And uh, we went out, went up to the Blue River. And we uh, went up there, and I know a guy's got some property up there, and so he was able to get on the water there. And all I wanted was this young man. And so th- what you're talking about, I was teaching the basics of how, of how to do this, right? Just the basics. And I, my only goal for the entire day was to put him on a fish. Well, you, you know, this, that you can get there and, and, you know, you, you, you cast, you roll cast it out there and it hits the water. You're getting a nice drift out there and you're going strike, strike, strike. And the, the, the novice doesn't see it. They don't know. It. Yep. And I'm like, Holy cow, man, there's fish all over here. And, and the young man said, so I'm trying to show him, you know, the, the intricacies of what he's looking for and when you try and set and all that kind of stuff. And the young man was having a tough time. And, and then he'd get frustrated and say, well, I just don't think there are any fish there. Show me. And so he'd hand me the rod. Well, you know, I cast <laughs> and boom, all of a sudden I catch a fish, right? And so we're playing that game all day yeah. long. And uh, we get to the last, I mean, it, it's probably 4.30 in the afternoon. And, and the father, Jeff, says to me, goes, Mark, we got to get going pretty soon. And we hadn't gotten a son of fish yet. And I'm like, oh, man. So I, I knew there was this one hole that we we fished earlier. And I thought, there's always fish there. Let's go on back. Just, we went back there. It's like the last 20 minutes of the day. And uh, I'm doing everything I can to get this young man this fish, right? And all of a sudden, I mean, his dad said, okay, 5 o'clock, we've got to go. It's drop-dead time. We've got to take off. All right. It's like 4.55, Will. And all of a sudden, the, you know, the, the, the indicator bobs. The kid <laughs> reacted perfectly, and he actually hooked something, right? <laughs> and I didn't think it was anything very big. Anyway... We end up getting that thing in the, well, we didn't get any, need a net because that fish was probably about that long. Okay. <laughs> it was, it was nothing to it, but I'll tell you what, we took a photo with that young man and, and here about a year ago, and this was by the way, I don't know, five, six, seven years ago. And, uh, we, uh, Joe, I saw Jeff here a short time ago and he said, my son still shows that photo to people <laughs> because he was so proud of himself uh, for catching that fish. But yeah. you know what? You, you and I both know that when you catch that first fish, and for me, by the way, for me, the first one I caught was on a dry fly. That was the first fly fishing fish I ever caught was on a dry. And I was so darn proud of the fact that I actually caught a fish, a trout, on a fly rod. Yeah. I was so excited, man. I was screaming from the mountaintops. And so I, I just, I got a copy of that photo in my phone and I just cherish it. It's this kid and he's holding this fish. And, and, uh, and I've got him, by the way, holding it way out in front of him, the best yeah, he exactly. can, making it look bigger on the photo. <laughs> and, and I'm so proud of that photo because I think it's, uh, that kid is smiling like a butcher's dog, man. Uh, he's so excited about it. That's great. That's great. Yeah. There's nothing in my book. I don't think there's, there's much much better than spending a day and afternoon an hour on the river, the water rushing by you watching, you know, trout sip and just reading the river. And it sounds like, you know, oftentimes when I'm out there, yeah. I'm, uh, I'm, it's almost like me- it's, it's meditative, but it's like, I, I, 
I don't, I'm not thinking of anything, you know, other than just reading the river and, and, you know, oftentimes I'll be singing the same, like uh, two or three lines of a song in my head the whole day. And I'll, sure. I'll go to the end of the day and not even realize that like, Oh man, if, I, <laughs> if my girlfriend was here, she would have killed me like three hours ago singing the same lines over and over, you know? <laughs> no, it, it's, it's the best. And you're right. It's, it's meditative, it's cathartic. Um, you know, I'm, I'm a strong believer. And so I, I stand out there and, and I have a conversation with the Lord when I'm standing out there in the water. Sometimes I ask him why I can't catch fish when I, I know they're there, but I can't seem to catch you. But uh, we have those conversations too. But yeah, there's never a bad day. You know, there, what, there's a great line. Oh, goodness. Um, it, it goes something along the lines. I cannot remember who it was that said it, but it was, uh, it, it says, um, a man will never step in the same river twice, for he is not the same man, and it is not the same river, right? Amen. And, and there's something there's something poetic about that, um, about fishing and what it does, and 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 how it affects us uh, when you're out there, because it's it's not about catching fish. That that's I, I'm convinced of that. When I was a kid, I always thought it was about you know catching fish. When I first started fly fishing, it was about catching fish. It's not about catching fish when I'm out there anymore. That's just a, a bonus when it happens. And if you have a good day, you feel good about it. And, and uh, you know, I, I'm a, I'm a catch-release guy every time anyway, so I, I'm going to put them back. But um, when you catch a fish, that's great, but that's not why I'm out there. I hear you. I'm right there with you. Well, Mark, uh, I'm, I'm going to wind it down. It's been a pleasure uh, chatting with you. I've, I've, I've liked picking your brain, and uh, it's always easy to talk outdoors with, uh, with you. It just flows naturally, right? <laughs> <laughs> I could go on for five more hours. <laughs> Well, I was going to say, when you, when you got a couple of guys and, and it's not a hobby, it's a passion, yeah. right? I mean, you know, I know it is for you. It is for me. Um, it's, it's something that it's not something I want to do. It's something I have to do. I have to be involved in this stuff. Um, it's, we live in a world, you know, Will, where we're losing this because fewer and fewer people, there was a time a hundred years ago where everybody lived out someplace and fishing and hunting was part of life. That's not the case anymore. You know what? 90% of people live in cities now. And, and so this has become a lost aspect in our culture. That connection with the wilderness, with uh, the outdoors, with wildlife is not there anymore. I mean, it, you know, it's amazing to me. Uh, I'll, be, I'll be up and ride my horse in the, in the National Forest here, not far from my place, and, and be out. And people will stop me, and they're fascinated by you know, the horse, they don't understand anything about the horse. So they, they want to know, can I pet the elk when I see them? But I mean, they, we've lost that ability to understand the world in which we live in. And, and that's why I think these kind of conversations, this kind of activity is important because it, you've got to have that connection. Um, you know, somebody once said, the further you get away from an agrarian uh, culture, the closer you are to a culture coming to its end. And, and we don't have much agrarian in us anymore. There are people that, that get dirt in their hands and, and understand what it means to harvest an animal because you're doing it for food and, and that kind of thing. That, that's a disappearing aspect of our culture. And, and those of us who still have to do that, I think we, we doggedly have to hold on to that, I think. I 100% agree. Uh, I couldn't have said it uh, anywhere near as well myself. Uh, so I, th I think we'll leave it with that, Mark, unless you got anything else uh, you'd like to like to leave us with. It's been it's been a pleasure chatting with you. I've enjoyed it, man. I've uh, you know, you and I've known each other for quite a while. And I'm just impressed with uh, what's going on in your life. And I appreciate you having me on. And there you have it. That is episode 72 with Mark Johnson on Buffalo Roamer Outdoors. Thanks for tuning in. Check out the website, uh, Guided Canoe Trips. We'll have a 2024 schedule coming out uh, relatively soon. Got some full 2023 trips still coming up. Uh, there's all kinds of blogs and fun stuff at buffaloroamer.com, social media at Buffalo Roamer. Thanks for checking out the podcast. Don't forget to subscribe and get outside, get some fresh air.